Hi, I'm Mike, owner of the In Group in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm going to do my list for the 10 best all analog records released in 2022. All right, I'm going to start with kind of a record that I don't think got as much love as it should have when it was released. I think it's a fantastic record. That is Johnny Col John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman. It is a vocal album. It is a jazz vocal album with John Coltrane filling in in the back. And I've always thought this is an excellent record. This has been reissued by audiophile labels for a long time. I think this is an album that's kind of with the newer audience, the newer generation of record collectors, has kind of fell out of favor. But I really dig this record. It's just a perfect record to sit down, relax. Uh, they're doing standards. They're doing Lush Life. That was done by Nat King Cole. They're doing great melodic music that's fantastic to just sit down, have a drink, relax. If you have friends over, uh, dance. Does anybody dance anymore? Do people? Is there romantic dances anywhere? This is the kind of music for that. But it's a great intro into John Coltrane and into jazz. The vocal stuff tends to be a good place for people to start and then move from there. You're not going to necessarily start with an Archie Shep record. That, that shouldn't be your introduction to jazz. It might be for some, but that shouldn't be your introduction to jazz. And that's this, this is a fantastic record for that. It's all analog. It's cut by Ryan K. Smith. It has the big, fat, thick, stoutin style tip on jacket. I think this was actually the first time in the series that they stopped making the jackets at Stoughton and moved to another company. But it's that same similar quality, real thick, gatefold, fantastic record. I highly recommend it. And uh, like I said, it's been done many times, but this is kind of the creme of the reissues of this so far, because it's not only fantastic sounding, but the packaging fits as well, which hasn't been the case with the reissues in the past. Okay. Blue Note Tone Poets, we can talk about them forever. Almost every single one of them, if not every single one of them, could make their way onto the list. But you got to kind of put John Coltrane's Blue Train on the list. They did it in a stereo to this set that included a disc of bonus material, which was also all analog. If you look on so inside of the uh, stereo uh, disc, there is a book, and that shows you photographs of the master tapes. And they also released a mono single disc LP. Both of these are all analog, and they're also both dedicated mixes. The mono is a dedicated mix that was run on a dedicated mono tape deck, and the stereo is the same, run on a dedicated mono a stereo tape deck. There was a small period of time where Rudy Van Gelder was running two machines at once before he realized, you know, I could just fold these down and save myself a lot of grief. So it's two dedicated mixes. It's not a fold down. And I kind of put this as one. I'm showing this as one. It's really a matter of preference. My preference in this particular case is the stereo disc because... You're getting the bonus material for not too much more money. What does the bonus material run you? It runs you an extra 16 bucks. The bonus disc is fantastic. It has the book. Uh, it sounds fantastic. The mono's fantastic as well. It's hard for me to pick. If I had to pick one, I don't have to pick one. But if I had to pick one, I would pick the stereo just because of for the extra 16 bucks what you're getting. There's not too much to say about this. All analog. This was done by uh, Kevin Gray, like all Blue Note Tone Poets, with Joe Harley. It is one of the greatest jazz albums of all time. I personally believe it is his best jazz album. I know, I think, time is kind of been good to Love Supreme, and that's kind of anointed Love Supreme as his best record. I actually think Blue Train, for me, is probably my favorite record of his, and I think it is his best record. It is the only high caliber tier one title I think that they have done as a tone poet so far. Most of these, the Art Blakey Monin, you know, the Cannonball Adderley, something uh, else, those are being done as Blue Note Classics. Fantastic sounding, but they have the real basic cover uh, presentation, not to the level as the tone poets, but also don't cost nearly as much. 
really any tone poet could be on this list. Any Blue Note classic series can be on this list, although there is one on the list. But they sound fantastic. But for overall presentation, for overall packaging, I'm going to go with the John Coltrane Tone Poet. I truly wish we could see more titles of this caliber as Tone Poets. On a side note, it was also the best-selling record I had as a store in any genre, in any record, for 2022. So that kind of tells you there is an insatiable demand for the high-quality, high-caliber jazz titles. Okay, this next one as well should come as no surprise to anybody. This is the 45 RPM Analog Productions UHQR of Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. Now, this is one of those records that... It's been done repetitively. It just never stops. Kind of Blue just keeps coming and coming and coming. What's different about this record, as opposed to a lot of the reissues, this was done from the original three-track master tape in the 90s. It was originally done for Classic. Analog Productions, who now owns Classic, took the original metal parts and made this reissue. On Higher quality vinyl, that's more consistent. I had a lot of issues personally with classic records back in the 90s. They constantly were changing vinyl formulations, pressing technique, whatever the case was, I had a lot of issues personally with inconsistencies. This for me was, when I got this, it's not very often that you're going to get an album. When did this come out? 1959? 40, 50, 60 some odd years later, it's not very often, 60 some odd years later, you're gonna get the definitive version of a record. You know, especially a record of this caliber that's just been done so many times, so many times. Classic Records did it like, well, there's like six variations just by Classic Records alone. They did a 33 RPM analog productions. They did this 45, Mobile Fidelity's done it. There's been SACDs, there's been Japanese DSD LPs, Going back through time, hundreds of releases. Nimbus did it as a supercut. Many, many releases is the point. But to get a definitive version was not something I was really expecting uh, to be released in 2022. You know, going back in time before we obviously knew this was coming. But that's what happened. And I think this is, if you're going to own one copy of Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, this is the one to own. And this is something, you know, I did a Miles Davis shootout and... Years ago, six, seven years, seven years ago. And, you know, I'm very familiar with the album. It's one of my favorite albums. It's a lot of people's favorite album. Uh, it's arguably the best-selling jazz album of all time. So I'm very familiar with the album. And this was the one that kind of took the cake for me. This is the one to own. The f And oddly enough, people say, well, is the 45 much better than the 33? A lot of times, it's marginally better. In this case, it is leaps and bounds better, which is very shocking to me. Okay, one of my favorite releases of the year for a lot of reasons. This was a record store day only release. This is Art Pepper meets the rhythm section. I don't know why I have that sleeve still on there or that price tag. Art Pepper meets the rhythm section. This is an all analog cut by Bernie Grunman release. This is the mono variation though. This was a record store day only release. There is a stereo coming later on this year. It's been pushed back. It was supposed to be released already, but it hasn't been. But this is a similar situation to the uh, to the Tone Poet. There is a dedicated stereo and a dedicated mono mix of this record. It's been a running joke I've had for a very long time, but the stereo releases of these early contemporaries are generally very hard panned. If you're familiar with the early... Uh, Beatles records in stereo, you know, you'd have vocals on one side, drums on another, or bass on another, guitar on, you know, that very hard panning. That has kind of been the issue I've always had with the stereo, although it's not bad. It sounds fantastic, but for me, this has been a better presentation. Uh, this here is, I think, the way to go with this particular album. This is the version where R.P. Pepper actually meets the rhythm section. The stereo, you got the rhythm section over here, you got the stereo, you got our pepper over here. It's, I've always thought it was kind of a jumbled mess. This is, I think, for me, the preferred way of listening to this album. 
the stereo is more desirable. Those contemporary or original contemporary stereo titles are extremely desirable, extremely sought after. And in most cases, the stereos all go for much bigger money than the monos. Unlike Blue Note, where the monos go for the big money. So there's not a, don't just assume, a lot of people I think assume that, oh, it's a jazz title. You got to go for the mono. You know, that's kind of a thing that's been perpetuated by people who have collected Blue Notes for a long time. But I think in this particular case with this album, again, where there's a dedicated mono mix, this is the way to go. Unfortunately, this was a record store day only release. But the thing about this one is it was a record store day only release. You had to get it from an independent record store. But it kept coming back and back and back to where I actually had this in stock for six or seven months. And I don't think it's until recently that this has been sold out. But they're still really inexpensive on the secondary market in that $30 to $40 range. Fantastic job. Bernie Grumman did it again, who worked at Contemporary. That's where he got started. He was originally in Phoenix, Arizona, had audio recorders here, moved out to California and got going with Contemporary. So he's very familiar with the catalog and he's the guy that really should have done this. And he's the guy who did do the catalog. Uh, tip on jacket, really well, well done. Our Pepper meets the rhythm section in mono. Record store day only though. Okay, so there's not going to be a lot of these probably coming on lists in the future. And that is music from um, releases from Mobile Fidelity. But here is one. This is an all analog release from Mobile Fidelity. Not something that is done too often these days. Most everything now is DSD. And unfortunately, this is an, you know, an analog list. So we're not going to see a lot of MoFi in the future. They did a lot of great releases this year, but they can't make the list. This, though, was a weird anomaly because this, David Crosby, is not only all analog. Why they chose to do this analog and not a lot of other titles analog perplexes me. This is the one occasion where Mobile Fidelity kind of went all out on the packaging and everything. Now, that's not something Mobile Fidelity is known for. This actually has that linen type feel. There's the Stout and Crunch. So this has that linen packaging, just like the original. Mobile Fidelity is not known for packaging. They never have been. The earliest Mobile Fidelity records from back in the late 70s to 80s were thin covers. Uh, they were really susceptible to cover wear. Going all, I mean, now they're significantly better to where they have a much thicker stout and tip on jacket, but they've never gone and done high quality replications of originals. That's never been their thing. You know, if there's foiling on a cover, they don't do it. If there's embossing on a cover, they don't do it. That's never been their thing. But this was a weird anomaly to where they actually went back and did the linen cover while also doing it all analog. On a side note, it sounds absolutely fantastic. It's an amazing sounding record. Uh, this particular one was done on super vinyl. It took a while to sell out. It wasn't a super quick sellout. They did 4,000 of them. It is now gone, but this was fantastic sounding. They did a great job on this. And like I said, they actually linen cover and everything. I wonder if that was something that was uh, maybe requested by the label or they, you know, I don't know the deal there. Okay. Here's a fantastic album. Something we don't see enough of. We see absolutely insurmountable amounts of high quality audiophile jazz records coming out. But short of a couple labels, you do not see a bunch of high quality R&B records being released. And this is the exception. Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? A little bit of a problem when this came out because the U.S. version of this album was actually cut from the original analog master tape by Kevin Gray at Coherent. Sounds absolutely fantastic. That is disc one. The bonus tracks on this are not analog, but the album itself is all analog, right? Now, if you look at that hype sticker, it actually mentions that Kevin Gray cut it. Well, the Europeans got a version of this as well that also has a hype sticker that says it was cut by Kevin Gray. It was not. From what I heard, something happened to the metalwork and they had to have somebody recut it quickly overseas. They recut it from a digital file. It is not the all analog cut. But here in the United States, I myself as well still have the all analog version of this. But it is absolutely fantastic because it is a reasonably priced audiophile R&B record that sounds fantastic. 
real thick, heavy stout and cover. Uh, it's a gatefold. I didn't, I wasn't nuts about, they did paper sleeves on these things, which kind of, this is how they come out of the packaging. You know, damaged and leaving chunks of paper on the vial. I ultrasonically clean records, so for me it wasn't as big of a deal as some people might have. Why they chose the paper sleeves, I'll never know because they everything else they went all out on. You hire Kevin Gray, you do an all analog cut, you do the pit, big thick stout and cover, you cheap out the last 30 cents on the sleeves. Beyond me, why that was done, I have no idea. I really wish more RMB records would get the audiophile treatment. And outside of you know, vinyl me please, there's really not consistent audiophile soul records being released. But for 2022, again, this was one of the best selling records I had. It's one of the greatest re records of all time. It's consistently on top 10 lists. I think most people agree. Although every now and then I get people who are like, oh, that record's awful. I, what are you talking about? But you know, we'll agree to disagree. You're wrong. Okay. Marvin Gaye, what's going on? All analog cut by Kevin Gray. Wow, this album took me by. <laughs> I was so blown away with this. This is the Impex release of Kenny Dorham's Matador. This is kind of an album that I don't think was on a lot of people's radar for Kenny Dorham. Uh, I don't think anybody expected this to be as popular and as desirable as it was once it was released. I know Impex didn't. They didn't make nearly enough of these. They sold out of them months before it was actually released. But it is absolutely fantastic. Look at that. Just like, oddly enough, the David Crosby record from Mobile Fidelity that had the same type of linen cover, they replicated that, like the original. Numbered to 5,000. What do I got there? 1550. This is numbered to 5,000. But, you know, a little look. Polyline sleeve. Press that RTI so it has a standard RTI sleeve. And then, of course... They give you a big thick sleeve on all Impex records. So, 180 gram vinyl. This was done by Chris Bellman from the original Analog Master Tape. He knocked it out of the park with this one. But this is an album that is, I don't even own an original of this. This is an extremely difficult album to find an original of. It's just from an era where, you know, maybe he just, 1962 originally released, but it was just an era where maybe he, this was a lull for him. I don't know what the deal was and why this album is so much more difficult to find than other records of his from that era, although nothing is super easy to find, but this is one that is really difficult to find. And it's perplexing for me how good this is in relation to how you never really heard too much about it until this release. Okay, so the sound quality on this thing is absolutely fantastic. The lineup is fantastic. You got uh, Jackie McLean and Bobby Timmons who wrote uh, Monin. Uh, on, he did it solo himself. And, of course, on Art Blakey's uh, Blue Note 4003. I hope I'm right on that. It's my favorite jazz album of all time. <laughs> and I've got like 15 copies, 20 copies of it. But uh, he's actually the songwriter of that. But fantastic record, fantastic release. I'm assuming this is probably going to get reissued as a non-numbered version. That is typically the case with Impex. On a real successful title, they'll do this numbered version where they put this sticker on it. And then they'll do a non-numbered version afterwards. Exactly the same thing without this sticker. And that's uh, hopefully, I haven't heard anything, hopefully that gets done again. That's a record that really needs to be put back in a print doesn't need to be a hundred dollar record it just came out it's a fantastic sounding record highly recommend it okay the oscar peterson trio we get requests another album that has been done ad nauseum by the audio file labels this though is the one to own it sounds absolutely fantastic it's an extremely accessible jazz album I think it's one of his best. It was his last, I think it was his last record for Verve. What did it come out? 64, I think 64. Uh, his last album for Verve. And for me personally, I think albums after this became very spotty. Uh, 2022, originally released in 65. Albums after this for him became very spotty. 
And he still had good albums, but I don't think he ever had anything quite to this caliber again. The sound on this record will blow your mind from the very first track to where you hear that upright bass being played with the bow. The sound is phenomenal on this. And if you're used to all those great blue note, audiophile blue notes, you never really hear heard a proper sounding piano on a record. Now, if you've obviously only listened to blue notes, but if you listen to other things, if you listen to this Oscar Peterson, we get requests, Piano's absolutely fantastic. Every instrument is so well placed on the soundstage. This is one of, if not one of the highest quality records, audiophile records you'll ever get. I highly recommend it just for the sound quality alone, but the music is fantastic. He does a cover of uh, The Girl from Impanema. It's all standards for the most part, so pretty easy, accessible standards. Girl from Impanema, fantastic. I highly recommend it. This is the one to get again. All analog. This was done by Ryan Smith, I believe. Done by Ryan K. Smith. He's pretty much doing most of the Verve series titles at this point. So yeah, Ryan K. Smith did this. Big, thick, tip-on jacket. Uh, big Stoughton-style tip-on jacket. Again, these have kind of switched from Stoughton to another company that's making the same style, high-quality tip-on jackets. But check this one out. If you're not a jazz fan, you'll still love this record. It's a fantastic sounding record. So give that a try. Okay. My favorite Blue Note classic title actually released in 2022. So I'm a little bit biased on this because of how great this record is and how difficult it is to find an original. That is Ronnie Foster's Two-Headed Fripp. I actually just did a new album that's pretty good as well. But this, I think, was his, his, his love supreme, Blue Train. This is a fantastic record. Extremely funky. When you put on the absolute first track, it's going to blow your mind how good it is. Organ, unbelievable. Sounds fantastic on this. This is one of those records that DJs have loved for years. Uh, Chunky is the opening track. Just it, It's awesome. Just sample that. Just sample that online. Just look up a YouTube clip of Chunky. And then imagine it sounding unbelievable, audiophile. And you know how you know how a good organ can sound on an audiophile record. It's powerful. It's bassy. It just it comes. I mean, this is the way to go with this. This record is fantastic. But the thing is, a lot of the Blue Note classics are either really cheap to get. You know, if they're doing a Bobby Humphrey title, for instance, you can get it for twenty, thirty bucks, or They've been done a bunch of times. They've been done as tone poets. They've been done as analog productions, uh, you know, in one form or another, right? So that's the thing. This is one of those records that they did that an original was very expensive, almost impossible to find. And when you did find them, they're beat, man, because DJs sampled the hell out of this record or played the hell out of this record. So you very seldomly could find, and I to this day have not been able to find a real clean original of this. So this kind of filled, this is kind of for me was the sweet spot. Hard to get. This is something I think could have been a tone poet because that kind of fits their philosophy of doing things that haven't really been reissued before or too much, more obscure things. But uh, maybe it was the right choice for a classic as well because of the, you know, the target audience is still going to be a lot of DJs uh, who are spinning vinyl. But fantastic record. Check this out. Two-headed frip. I've talked about it a few times uh, on the channel. It's just fantastic. Okay, so I said there was going to be 10, but I'm actually going to do 11. And we're going to do 11 because it's one better than 10. It, it's one more. Okay, here's another one. This was kind of a gist. There's a couple titles that they've done, but this is Curtis Mayfield Superfly by the Runout Groove. A fantastic record, right? This was actually done all analog from the original master tape by Kevin Gray. Now what you got, let me kind of show you this packaging here. I'm going to crack this open. So the bonus disc is not analog, right? Oh, shit. The bonus disc is not analog, but they did this really nice gatefold. Okay. Let me show you that. I got a cool number on this too. I got number 100. They did this cool gatefold. Not quite stout. They did polyline sleeves. 
They did a turntable mat that they included with it. Not that you're ever going to use a felt mat, but, you know, the packaging, right? So you got the Superfly mat, okay? It includes a poster. I think that includes a poster. You got an analog, full-blown audio file disc one, and then you've got a bonus disc, which has, it's digital, but fantastic. You've got radio spots, instrumentals, demo tracks on it, single mix of Superfly, single mix of Freddy's Dead, a pusherman. You get an alternate mix with the horns. These are numbered. Super uh, Runout Groove typically does limited release stuff to where it's not in print forever. But for some reason, this just didn't sell out. This is stuck around, and I'm pretty sure I still have this. This is a killer title. And I would say pick this up while you can. The sound quality on this thing's fantastic. All analog Kevin Gray, right? But everything else you get with it. And it's reasonable. It's an under $40 record for what you get. So I highly recommend that. They did more of the monkeys as well in the same similar fashion, analog cut by Kevin Gray. And that was fantastic. But this is such a, to me, it's a better recording. Uh, again, really well done R&B records. Done proper from the analog tape are, are mind boggling. There's a lot of great ones. Okay, number 11, because it's, one more better, is Ornette Coleman's The Shape of Jazz to Come. So this is done by Vinyl Me Please. Vinyl Me Please is absolutely turned into one of the best audiophile labels. I have a couple of gripes with audio, Vinyl Me Please to this day. The books drive me crazy because they stuff these little books inside of the jacket that cause a lot of times warping. They package their records in the cheapest, crummiest cardboard known to man, they're almost surely going to come to you with damage every single time. Which, to me, doesn't make a lot. And they didn't used to be real good at returning them. Uh, they would wanted to give you a $5 credit. I've not experienced that anymore. Their customer service is up to the next level. So there's the drawbacks. But the positive things with Vinyl Me Please is they are doing extremely high-quality reissues, audiophile reissues. They're doing some of the absolute best jackets money can buy. They're doing those thick Stoughton jackets, but a lot of times they're spot, They're even to the next level. They're spot-glossed, they're foil-embossed, you know, they're very good on their sourcing, right on the hype sticker here and on their website. AAA, lacquers cut from the original monotapes by Ryan Smith at Sterling Sound. Pressed on 180 gram black vinyl at RTI. Listening notes booklet ugh, by Marcus Moore. Maybe ditch the booklet, put it on a on a sheet, something flat that is not going to warp the record. That would be my only gripe. But this, unlike you know, you think this has been done down a bunch. People ask me, Mike, how does this compare to the Speaker's Corner? How does it compare to the ORG? How does it compare to the Rhino? Well, it doesn't because this is mono. They did something totally different here. They did the mono mix of this. The other ones were all stereo. This sounds fantastic, and truth be told, there's a lot of Vinyl Me Please titles I can include. What's great about Vinyl Me Please is they're doing things that typically have not been done before. They've got a country, uh, they've got a country uh, club now. They're doing audiophile Dolly Parton records and Willie Nelson records that haven't been done, and they did an all analog reissue of the Beastie Boys. What was it? Check Your Head, I think it was. All analog. It's like, well, really? Nobody would go through the trouble of doing an audiophile Beastie Boys record, but they did. They do a lot of great R&B records. They've done Aretha Franklin. They do a lot of stuff on stacks. They've really done an absolute fantastic job of doing audiophile records that not everybody is doing over and over and over again, and they're doing them from, you know, in an extremely high quality fashion. So it's a label that really has become a try. I mean, they are an audiophile label through and through for the most part. They do some squirrely electronic records or color variations type club stuff, but which is more for the masses. But they'll do a lot of like hardcore audiophile records as well. So it's a really good label. There was a lot of stuff I could have chose. But I always like to choose, when I do these lists, I like to choose the stuff that is 
very difficult to get. Good luck finding a really minty copy, original mono of this that plays quiet on that early crummy Atlantic vinyl. It's just not gonna happen. It's extremely difficult. And if it does, it's gonna cost you a ton of money. So I like to include those types of records as opposed to other records to where they're out there at more affordable money or there's been other reissues of them. This for me is kind of the sweet spot. Really hard to get, really desirable records that are really expensive to buy originals. All right, so that is the top 10 slash 11 because it's one more better, uh, audio file, all analog records of 2022. All right, guys, check us out online at theingroove.com. Until next time.